I actually grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, or outside Atlanta. I was there until I was 13. And then we moved to Illinois. Well, I think I may have on my YouTube channel a film that I made when I was like like five. <laughs> I remember I wanted my parents to help me shoot. I was calling it Ghostbusters 3. It was just, I loved the movie Ghostbusters, I guess, at the time. Uh, so that was the earliest thing I ever did. I actually submitted that to NYU as part of my portfolio when I was applying for film school, just because I thought it was so funny that like I'm on camera yelling like, cut, cut. But, um, but it was really when I was, when I was, when I moved to Illinois, made some friends there. We eventually found an old camcorder in my parents' closet, you know, that hadn't been used in 10 years. It was an old VHS camcorder. And we just started playing around with it. And that was probably my first experience with, you know, experimenting in front of the camera. Um, and then, you know, we had, we had film classes, we had video classes in high school and a lot of my friends were involved in that. So I just gravitated towards that. No, I don't think so. I think like all, like all teenagers, I was, you know, when, when you first pick up a camera, really you want to you want to create something that's not amateur video. You want to create something that feels like what you see in movies. So you're drawn towards like guns and blood and you know, you, you're, you're drawn towards the special effects. I mean, you see that in a lot of, a lot of young films. It's just for the, the first time you start playing around, you just want to see if you can make something that feels anything like what you're used to seeing on TV and in movies. Um, so I think that's what everyone does. They kind of just try to see like, can I even do that? Can I make anything like that? So I think we all make those kind of films uh, at the beginning until we find, kind of figure out like what our voice is. I think it was just a one, one time thing. Yeah. I, I didn't, you know, I don't think I knew as a child I wanted to be a filmmaker. I think probably when I look back at my whole youth, I recognized that I wanted to be creative. You know, I wanted to draw. Uh, I probably, at an early age realized I wasn't very good at drawing. <laughs> you know, I could copy things. I couldn't like come up with my original drawings. Uh, and in middle school, I started to get drawn towards, towards uh, architecture. And I think it was a way to be creative, but kind of within the, the constrictive bounds of math. Like, you know, you can only draw so many things on a, on, on lined paper. Uh, I've always been more of like a mathematical science kind of minded person. And so it's hard for me to find a creative outlet because uh, I'm not naturally gifted in that way. So I think filmmaking is, is nice because it is a lot of math and science. It's, it's technology. It's, it's engineering. It's equipment. Can you use the, the technology to make something artistic? And I think that's why I eventually fell into that. But it takes, you know, your whole, whole youth to figure that out. Oh, definitely math, math and science. I loved physics. Um, I think my senior year of high school, as I started to realize I wanted to be a filmmaker, I thought it would be important for me to branch out and get better at things that I wasn't great at. So I, I started taking an honors English class. I, th I started taking some like creative writing classes. I started focusing on that kind of stuff that I hadn't been great at or hadn't been my focus. Um, just a, I don't know. I don't know if it did anything for me, but <laughs> I I wanted to think that I was growing as a person. Well, yeah, and, and it, yeah, you don't have to like, you know, not everyone needs to land in film having followed the same path there. Uh, but I, I did do theater. I did like behind, I did like technical theater. I built sets and stuff when I was in high school. Pro I mean, I, I grew up, Loving films, of course. I mean, I, I loved Star Wars and, and Back to the Future. And I, it's funny, I, I probably really like these very, like, fantastical world films. And that's not anything like what I do. I, I don't think that I could or should do those things. Um, so I, I guess maybe I'm inspired by films in, as, a, as an audience member in a different way than I'm inspired by films as a, as a creator. Um, for For documentaries, it was really in college that I started watching... Uh, filmmakers like Errol Morris is a is a great documentary filmmaker. Werner Herzog, uh, and those those started to inspire me. I think more in the way that I approach film, um, and and the kinds of things I want to. Uh, in high school, I went to a pretty new high school. I was the third class, and so there were a lot of young teachers there, 
And when you put a lot of young single teachers in a high school together, I guess they were probably meeting each other and, and getting married. <laughs> you know, there are a lot, it seemed like a lot of our teachers were getting married. They were just marriage age, uh, you know, fresh out of college. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I was, and I was in the film, I was in the video program, you know, I, I took those classes. And so teachers would come to my teacher and say like, Hey, we're getting married. Uh, you know, do you have any students who could help, you know, film our wedding? That'd be great. You know, I'm sure they're looking for cheap work. And, uh, so I think my first job was me and a friend of mine. We filmed a wedding. I think we charged $200 or something. Maybe it was even less than that. Maybe it was a hundred. Uh, this would have been, yeah, like, like, it was probably like 2000, 2001. Well, I mean, it still wasn't, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I guess it was for our skill level. Uh, but yeah, l looking back, it's like a year, even just a few years later, I was, I was charging a lot more for, for weddings. Uh, cause you don't realize how much work a wedding is. You go all day long shooting and then the editing takes, can take three times longer. So really you have about 40 or 50 hours of work that you're doing and, you know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was the first, that was the first thing I ever did. And I ended up doing a lot more wedding videos later in, in life. Well, I, you know, obviously as a, as a junior and senior in high school, thinking I wanted to be a filmmaker, I figured I had to go to film school. So I applied to places like USC and I applied to NYU and I didn't get into everywhere at first. Uh, I got on the waiting list at NYU and I just got lucky. I guess they, they picked me on a second round. Uh, so I, I got to go to NYU. Um, I learned a lot there, but I actually, I wasn't, I didn't take college very seriously at first or, you know, I, I got distracted by a lot of things. I, New York was very exciting and I had a job. I was in a fraternity. I was on the speech team. I was doing all these other things except for going to class. And so I actually failed out of NYU after, uh, after two years of studying there. And which was silly because I had been such a good student in high school and I just kind of thought like, well, you can't fail. Like you've never failed. Like nothing, no matter, even if you don't go to class, it won't matter. Uh, so it was kind of a wake up call. And I, so at that point I ended up going to Illinois where a lot of my friends were. And I, I finished my undergraduate degree at Illinois state university. And that's actually where I picked up a lot of the skills that I use today. Cause I, they didn't have a film program. So I took classes in the communication school and they had, they had, you know, TV news was a big thing. They were, they did there. They have a, a TV station called TV 10. So I studied there. I, I learned a lot about documentary filmmaking. Um, I had to make a lot of news stories, which turns out now that I work in news, that was helpful, I guess. Uh, but, but actually a lot of what I do as a documentary filmmaker is a lot more like news than it is like narrative feature films at NYU. So I feel like most of the, the useful training I got was actually at Illinois State University. Yeah, well, what's funny is back then, uh, in TV news, they still edited on linear machines. We did this in high school too, meaning, no, it wasn't even, it wasn't even film. It was, uh, you know, it was video, um, but it, it's on cassettes. I don't think it was, maybe they were VHS cassettes. I can't remember. Um, but you have, you essentially just, you, you pop in your source tape into one machine and you pop in your, your, I don't know what it's called, your, your output tape into another machine. And these machines are like fancy VS VCRs. You could like, you know, go frame by frame, but you're just manually picking in points and out points and then telling it to write it onto another tape. <laughs> I haven't seen that, but it, but it, it for, for TV news that it was actually a quick way to edit. Like sometimes, you know, with digital editing, you're spending so much time importing the footage. It can actually be pretty quick to, if you're doing a very simple edit to do it. Uh, it's called linear editing because you have to do it in order. You have to start at the beginning of your story and pick the right shot. You can't go out of order. That's why digital editing is called nonlinear. Although we don't, you know, those terms are not very important anymore because everyone does nonlinear editing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, we didn't do film at ISU, but I think what I found was that any school you go to, there's going to be students interested in filmmaking, whether or not there's a major or not. So, you know, you go to a public university without a film program, there's still going to be pe people there that want to make films and you just have to find those people. You know, there's probably student clubs that meet after class and, you know, you can, I think you could find a film education anywhere. Even if you don't go to college, it's, you know, online, you can learn this stuff.
Woody Woody Allen was failed out of NYU. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm nowhere near the caliber of Woody Allen, but it's nice to know that other people didn't make it either. <laughs> well, I so I I was at Illinois State University. Uh, they convinced me I should stick around and get my master's degree. Uh, which meant that I was teaching. You can actually like get your master's degree for free if you work for the school while you're doing it. Um, and a lot of you'll discover this when you go to college. A lot of a lot of teachers are actually not even like professors. They're graduate students. You know, they're they're people who have graduated who are you know decent experts in their field. Uh, you know, new experts and teaching the, the lower level classes. So I was teaching. That's how I got into being an actual teacher. Um, at that school. Uh, at the time, I also got an internship with State Farm uh, Insurance, which it wasn't even a video job. It was a social media job because I also know computers. And so they thought that would be a good fit for me. But while I was there, I showed them that I could do video because they were shooting some video and it didn't look the best. And I was like, I can actually do this too. Um, and I've recently learned that's, a, that's called job crafting, where you take the job you have and turn it into the job you want. And I've actually been able to do that at several places. So um, uh, that's kind of how I like turned my career into a real video career. And then I, I got the job at Indie Mogul because uh, a friend of mine, Justin, who started Indie Mogul, uh, once they were bought out by Google, he decided to leave and thought that maybe I should, uh, I could do that job pretty well. So he recommended me. Yeah, and actually, I found that every one of the jobs I've had so far has come from someone thinking of me, not me looking for it and applying for it. So I've, you know, it's obviously really important to do good work, be nice to people and make sure people know what you're capable of because then opportunities can come your way. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely prefer documentary and I think it's something I'm still kind of figuring out as I go. Uh, I think all of us as filmmakers, especially it's like, we want to, we want to do everything. Like I'd love to make a, I'd love to make a feature narrative. I'd love to think that I could, but I might not be the right guy to make a, a feature narrative film. Uh, I I'm better at making short documentaries. And so I think a lot of this business is just figuring out what you're good at and, and focusing on that and letting other people make, great narrative films. Um, so yeah, it was great. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm an optimistic person, so I'm always looking for, for whatever I can gain out of a job. And that was that job, especially I learned so much. I mean, it was a job that forced me to learn something new every week. I felt like I had to, every week that I made a video, I had to learn a whole lot about the subject matter so that I could be an authority and, and teach it. Yeah. Uh, it was really, uh, I mean, on the production days, I mean, I, I spent several days writing and researching an episode uh, and then, you know, shooting B-roll and, and then shooting myself on camera and then editing. I, so for like the last three days of the week leading up to an episode, I'd really be just working on that episode. The other days of the week, you know, I'm dealing with... Uh, you know, maybe helping Russell uh, with what his ideas are for his episode. Uh, but also running a YouTube channel means a lot of like engaging the fans. So the people, there's comments coming in. You want to answer those questions. Um, you know, you want to promote things and answer questions on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere. So just trying to keep up with, you know, every time you post something, then there's people actually engage, you know, they're there watching it. And, and so it was just a lot of like being part of that community and just, you know, trying to learn from them and, and teach them as much as I could. It was 2013. It was two years. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It was like a really big number of, of videos that we put out that Russell and I put out together. Uh, I think we put out about a thousand videos. Uh, So actually, I mean, that was a big part of what I learned is just 
suddenly I'm having to put out a lot of work. And so it's a matter of, you know, just kind of, you know, developing those muscles of being able to turn out work that quickly. Uh, but also learning that things don't have to be perfect to be good. Like you have to let go of a project at a certain point because it's better to have a completed project available for someone to watch than to have a perfect project that no one ever sees because you couldn't finish it. I mean, Sriracha, I could have kept working on it for many more months and made it into the perfect film that I wanted, but uh, it wouldn't have done any good if I never got it out. And so the same with weekly videos. Sometimes you just have to say like, you know, this is good enough that people are really going to appreciate it uh, and I should I should stop working. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, I think the worst kind of perfection is the people that want something to be perfect and they don't yet have the skills or the technology to, to make it perfect. So they just don't make it like they wait. So they're like, well, I'll make this film when I get a better camera, but you, you won't. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you'll always be waiting. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot better to make, just keep making stuff with whatever camera you have. And, uh, you'll learn a lot from that process. We well, yeah, Mark Duplass, the uh, is a is a very successful filmmaker and actor right now, and he he talks about making three dollar films with his brother, and just make a lot of them. <laughs>
especially a year into Indie Mogul, I'd learned so much, uh, so much new stuff to add on to all the experience I already had that I just thought, like, I think I'm at that point where I could make a film. I should be at this kind of festival premiering something. I think I'm that, that level now. And it was a moment where I realized I'd been afraid to call myself a filmmaker because I never thought that anything I ever made was a real film, that it was all just like videos for clients or you know educational videos. These are important things, but they're not films. They're not the kind of things you show on a big screen, uh, you know, in a, in a movie theater. And I just wanted to accomplish that. I thought that was just important for my personal development. So I just knew I had to make a, a film, and I knew I loved documentaries, especially short documentaries, and I thought that's what I should probably do. And I love Sriracha, so I made, decided to make a film about Sriracha. <laughs> it was 2013 that I started and finished the film. It was about eight months, I think, because uh, I because I went to the film festival in March and I came back at the end of March thinking I'm going to do this. So I started in April and by December I had finished and released the film. Well, really everything I'm doing is for Bloomberg politics right now. It's a, it's a busy job. It's a busy time in politics, obviously. Uh, so there's plenty, plenty to cover there. So I wish I could do more on the side, but I don't even have time to, even think about what I would be doing if I had more time. <laughs> well, it was the, it was through the Sriracha documentary, and you know, it, it turned out that was the I, that was the best career decision I ever made was making that film. I didn't know it at the time. I just I knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker and that I wanted that on my reel, and I thought I could make a good film. Uh, and I really just did it for personal reasons, but it, it not to make money or anything. But it turned out it, it has made money. It also led to this job at Bloomberg. Someone at Bloomberg saw the film and just thought, even though it has nothing to do with politics, thought that's the kind of visual, you know, creativity we want. Uh, it's led to other opportunities. Like I started, I, I taught this class online. I mean, so many things. You know, people probably know me a lot better now just because of that, that film. So it just turned out that was the smartest thing I could have done, and I didn't. I didn't really know it. So I think I, I recommend now everyone should should go, you know, go do something that would make your, you really happy. You know, go make a passion project. And you don't know what kinds of opportunities will come from it. But I love it because I'm making I'm making work that I'm really proud of at Bloomberg. I mean, it, it is all like short documentary stuff. Yeah, in fact, you know, I like to learn. So when I got there, I thought, well, I'll start using their equipment. I'll use their, they use a C100, a big cinema camera, uh, a powerful camera. It looks great. Um, but instantly when I took it into the field, it's just a much bigger camera than mine. And I was holding it over my head. You know, I'm in a scrum of reporters surrounding the candidate. And I have to, you know, do this to get the shot. And it just hurt, <laughs> you know, so much heavier. And it, it takes up a lot more space in my bag. And and I realized that I shoot differently with different, you know, the, the kind of gear you have affects the way you, you approach a shoot. Well, yeah, there's something to be said for using the camera that you're best at. Like, no reason to get that real expensive camera if you're going to be worse with it. And so that was me in the C100. I just wasn't a good filmmaker anymore because I, I wasn't good at using this camera. So I realized the reason they hired me is to shoot the way that I shoot, and a lot of the way I shoot is because of the lightweight gear that I use, and I can pack it easily, and I can carry it on my back. And So I just went back to my own stuff. So I still use my own stuff. It's not because they won't get me the equipment I want. I just prefer it. It's Avid, uh, just because that's, I mean, that's what people use in the television industry. Uh, it's a television a broadcast news organization. But I actually use Final Cut 10, uh, which is what I've been using for, for three or four years now. Uh, and it has its flaws, but I, I'm a fast editor with it. I'm, I'm best with that. And so I, I would love to learn Premiere again. I, I used that in high school, but uh, I just haven't had a, a down moment to, <laughs> to stop doing what I'm doing.
When I first started editing, we used a program, and I'm sure this company still exists, called Pinnacle, uh, but I don't know. I, I know their software, Studio DV, is probably very outdated. That's what we used at the time. But it was our first editor, and it, it was single-track editing, uh, which meant that we were doing a lot of multicam shoots like weddings, and we had to do this crazy math every time we wanted to do a cut because it was like, how long has it been since we last were on that last shot? Okay, now let's take that length, chop that off this shot. And now if we put that in, okay, it all works out. But yeah, we couldn't just easily cut back and forth. But yeah, that's a lot of the fun of this industry is trying to figure out how to make things look professional, but doing them with almost no money. You know, what open source or DIY or, you know, how can we, how can we fake it till we make it? Well, it's funny because, like, you're at a point in your career where you don't have a lot of money yet, so you can't buy the things you, you want or think you need to make your projects. But what you do have that's an advantage over older people is you have time. Like, right now, I don't have any time to go learn, you know, a new piece of software. I just I can't do that right now while I'm in the middle of all these projects. But you can – I mean, this is how I felt when I was your age. I could just spend – forever learning Premiere and just getting really good at it. I mean, you can pick any software you want and just become an expert in it. And you have that advantage over older people. You'll go into the, you'll go into your career knowing something really well. I think you have to, you have to escape from the, the quest for perfection because that's, that's never going to happen, right? Like you would keep working on something forever to make it perfect. Like I think, uh, so I, I think rather it's, it's more important to make stuff that makes you happy, that makes your audience happy. You know, you want like one thing I try to do with my videos is like, I want to make people smile. So when I'm editing, I'm like, Oh, this is actually, you know, if, if it makes me really happy to watch it, then I should make sure it's in the final piece. Um, so I think just figure out like, what's the point of your piece and then, accomplish those goals, not necessarily making it the most perfect piece of art. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both, but yeah, it's an, it's intentional, but it's also my philosophy on, on video. I want to present candidates as they are and let you decide what that means to you. And so I love that I put out videos where, like, for example, I might make a video about Donald Trump, put that online, and the Trump people might tweet it because they love it. And everyone, all the Trump supporters love it, and they share it with the world. And then you have all the anti-Trump people, they also share it because they're like, oh, man, this proves that he's terrible. Like, I love it when both sides take the video I've made, they run with it because they think it, it shows what they want to say about the, this candidate. Uh, and ideally, they don't talk about me. Like, I'm invisible as a filmmaker. They kind of forget that someone had to make it. And, you know, I hate it when I get the criticism. I don't want the criticism. I'd rather they criticize the content, you know, the things inside the video. Um, but I also, I have biases. Of course, of course, I have political leanings myself, but I think it's important as a journalist to one, not overtly say what my opinions are, because that I, I shouldn't be trying to tell people what to think. I just want to show them the facts. Uh, and two, it's important to just recognize my own bias and make sure that doesn't creep into the, the piece. So I have to recognize uh, that and try to avoid it. Yeah, I do, I do think that Bloomberg is very is very centered, uh, very unbiased. I think it's an interesting question because I, I definitely don't know, and I, I but it, it points to how I approach film because I think. It, it's almost scary to think like, ooh, if I had unlimited money and unlimited time and unlimited talented people, what could I make? Like, I, I, I don't know. That's, that's too much. <laughs> that's too, yeah, I mean, it's just like I, I need some creative restrictions. I like not having infinite money for a project or infinite time. Like, I, I like starting from what do I have, what access do I have, and how can I make something with these constraints? Because I, I get too confused if, if I have the world available to me. I need to be very focused. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I want, I, I kind of want to be inspired and, and figure out what, what films to make. I don't really know off the top of my head what I actually want, I guess. 
For me, um, there are there are weeks when I'm in the office uh, and I, I go in. We have a, a 9.15 meeting where we talk about what our 5 o'clock show is going to look like. And then we start going, you know, working all day. Um, so some of the projects I do might be something I do entirely in the office. Maybe we take some clips uh, of some, you know, things candidates have said over the over that day and we cut them up. Maybe we add some voiceover and some graphics or something. So I might work on a project entirely at my desk. Uh, but I actually, I don't do a lot of that. Uh, mostly what I'm doing is going out. So like this week, we have the we have the primary coming up in New York, so I've been able to go out and film things right in the city. I don't even have to travel very far. Um, so almost every day this week, I've been outside the building with my camera, shooting things during the day. Usually shooting until about noon or or one o'clock, and then I'm back in the office trying to edit the thing that I've shot by five p.m. I actually have a little bit more time than five p.m. because I don't necessarily even have to have the video done. By the time the show starts, I just have to have the video done by the time it airs in the show. So if it's airing at 5.45 in our hour-long program, I can get it done maybe by 5.20 and still be okay, maybe even later. Um, but, I, of course, I have to have it done early enough or at least a rough cut done early enough that people can actually watch it and say, yeah, that's what we actually want to put on the show. And then I'll finish the, edit the audio editing or something. But then I also travel a lot, so some weeks I spend the entire week on the road, you know, in South Carolina or Wisconsin or wherever. I try to pack as light as I can. I, I carry a suitcase full of, well, I put my clothes in it, but it's mostly camera gear uh, that I can't fit in my backpack. I actually put one bag inside my suitcase, and then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to carry most of my camera gear uh, in a large backpack, and then I also carry my, my tripod my tripod on the plane but I don't have to check a bag. No, I sold those long ago. Um, and my GH3 just broke on a recent trip. Uh, so I had, so I ordered a new GH4. Uh, so actually I have two GH4s now. Uh, and I bring both of them when I travel because I might have one shooting a time lapse or something on a tripod while I'm at an event shooting B-roll. I try to you know, get as much done at the same time as I can. Or if I do an interview, I might need two cameras, you know, one on the interview subject, one on the other person. No, it's usually just two GH4s and a GoPro is what I Oh yeah, I do have the I do have the three sixty camera, yeah, the the Theta S, which I've been playing with. But you can't really you can't use them together. People always ask me that. They always think like, oh, you'll shoot with the three sixty, and then you'll put that in your two D video. It's like, well, no, the quality is completely different. It looks terrible if I tried to compare it to the DSLR. And I think David Fincher, I might even have a, a, doesn't he have a memoir? I don't think I've read it, but, uh, I mean, all of these filmmakers, a lot of these filmmakers probably have their own books. Um, I can't remember what books I was reading in high school about film, uh, but there's plenty of, you know, there's behind the scenes where we have so much action filmmaking. But yeah, I think I think as long as you have an appetite for learning, you'll be fine. I don't think there's any specific thing you need to read as a filmmaker. Just go try to learn as much as you can. Not be entirely what another filmmaker does, but I think you you find the thing that you like to do, what really appeals to you, and you you know you're probably taking that from a bunch of filmmakers and and from other things, from TV shows you watch, I and mean, hopefully you're picking up inspiration everywhere. All the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I constantly feel like there are other filmmakers, especially living in New York now, I'm surrounded by really talented people. So I always feel like there's people that can do what I do much better. Uh, and it's because everyone, everyone has, you know, everyone has their, their, their strengths and weaknesses. So there are always going to be people that can shoot better than me. There's always people that can edit better than me. Hopefully I have a nice balance of it. And I think that's what, I think that's one of my skills is that I have, enough of everything that I can kind of be a one man band. But I also recognize I'm not the guy to do every project. There's always, uh, 
so I think it's just it's coming to grips with what you can do well and just you know do that. Don't try to do everything better than everyone because that's impossible. I think it's. I mean, I guess I, I wouldn't necessarily want to like change my path. You know, I don't want to go back and tell younger me like, oh, don't do that. Do this instead. Because like all of it was useful. You know, you learn something from all your failures. Um, but it, I think what you hopefully come to realize through that process is that there are things you're really good at and there are things you're not good at. And you don't have to do the things you're not good at. Like you don't have to make, like I don't have to make a feature film if I'm not a screenwriter and maybe that's not the, the kind of project that suits me best. Uh, so, I mean, just you, you figure out what you're, what you're great at and then just do the project for those skills. And I think, I think my advice is just make a lot of work, you know, make as many things as you can because it's all great practice. Uh, but you'll also, through that process, discover the things you're really good at and just keep doing more of that and avoid the things you're not great at. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to emulate someone else. You don't have to copy someone else's style. You'll figure out your own voice and your own style by focusing on the things that you do really well. Right. Well, yeah, I really love like what Casey Neistat does is, you know, he does a lot of like DIY and he shoots on a point and shoot camera. It's just like a style that works for him. And he's made that into his own look that just works really well. And he probably shouldn't try to shoot the way that other people shoot. Well, yeah. And I've, I've learned that uh, you can have low quality video, but if you have high quality audio, it kind of makes up for it. I think it's better to have better audio and worse video than the other way around. You know, you can have the most beautiful video ever, but if it's hard to hear, it just feels very amateur.